And we're back for another episode of Peak Human. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Sanders. Thanks for listening. Thanks for starting back at episode one. Didn't say that last time. Always try to remind people that there's so many good episodes back in the archives. Gotta go listen to them all. Also, give the podcast a review on iTunes or the podcast app. And, of course, check out Nose the Tail. Nose the Tail is my company supporting all the great ranchers here in Texas. So, before I go into that more, I've got to talk about my guest today, Dan Kittredge. He is so amazing. He travels the country speaking about regenerative agriculture, about nutrient density, about his device that he's developed at his nonprofit that measures nutrient density. It's so cool. He uses mass spectronomy. It's the stuff that Dr. Stefan von Vliet talked about in my episode with him. The other 70,000 secondary compounds that are in food, it uses light to read the nutrients. It's such cool stuff. A little bit more about Dan. Dan Kittredge has been an organic farmer for more than 30 years and is the founder and executive director of the Bionutrient Food Association, a nonprofit whose mission is to increase quality in the food supply. Known as one of the leading proponents of nutrient density, Dan works to demonstrate the connections between soil health, plant health, and human health. Out of these efforts was born the Real Food Campaign, now the Bionutrient Institute, which has engineered a prototype of a handheld consumer spectrometer designed to test nutrient density at point of purchase. Via the Bionutrient Meter, the goal is to empower consumers to choose for nutrient quality and thereby leverage economic incentives to drive full system regeneration. This is amazing stuff. It is so cool. You can get one of these devices and go to your store and measure all the different foods there and compare and see which ones are the most nutrient dense and which ones aren't. This is for each food though, not against other foods, but for that specific food, which is more nutrient dense than the other brand of that specific food, like a banana, whatever. Really cutting edge stuff. He works with a lot of the guests I've had, like Fred Provenza, Dr. Stefan Van Vliet, Mark Schatzker, all the great nutrient density, soil health, regenerative ag people, amazing stuff. Gabe Brown, Joel Salton. This is an amazing guy doing great work. He's not compromising. He's not letting any investment come in. He's only taking donations. It's all about keeping that integrity of this nutrient density score and what they're doing with the device and keeping the data and making sure companies don't take this and falsify things, make their food seem better, any kind of funny business. So something I really believe in, he seemingly coined the term nutrient density or popularize it, which is awesome because it's one of my favorite things ever. It's so important to how we eat and how we live and stay healthy. So really great episode with Dan. A little more about Nose to Tail. Nose to Tail is my company where we do all these practices he's talking about. And I want to get our meat verified. When they start doing meat, I want to show that it has more nutrient density. It has more of these secondary compounds because at Nose to Tail, my ranchers in Lubbock, we have a huge diverse rangeland that they graze on, all kinds of different species of forages and all the different things, giving their meat and fat so many more nutrients. It's not just sitting on a monoculture. Even if something is grass finished, doesn't mean it's getting all of these nutrients from all the different plants that makes a good diet for the animal and get, makes their meat healthier, more biodiverse, also regenerates the land, helps the soil, does all of these things. So. We're practicing what he preaches. We're doing all those great things at Nose to Tail. You can get it shipped directly to you. We do beef, we do bison, we do lamb, we do chicken and pork. We do it all. Some things are out of stock, yes, because we're a boutique operation. We're not a Costco, we're not an Amazon. We don't just have constant stock of this stuff. We are growing these animals one by one and selling them and we sell the whole animal. That's the whole point, Nose to Tail. You get the bones, you get all these things. We need people to buy all the bits and pieces. We put the bits and pieces in the ground beef. For example, we do primal versions of all the meats actually, and we get the really nutrient dense organ meats into the ground beef, into the ground chicken, into the ground pork, whatever it may be. We get you those organs that usually people throw away for some reason, because <laughs> that has all the nutrient density where all the nutrition is. People don't like the taste, so we sneak them in our products, in the ground products, so you don't even notice them. You could also add seasonings to those, so you don't even notice them even more. We have great nose to tail seasonings with no funny stuff, really clean, freshly ground, really great. I use them every single day. We have body care. We're even using that tallow. We're using the fat. We are making body care products out of it. We have our skin food back in stock. Get it while you can. We got a big order in, so hopefully it'll last. This stuff is really great. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's amazing. 
And then we also have biltong. Biltong, dried meat, on the go. Soft, tender, not like jerky where it's all dry. No funny stuff again. No sugar, no curing agents. This biltong is the best jerky you can get. So get that all at nosetail.org. Listen to this great one with Dan. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you share it with a friend. Hope you come see me at the Sapien Center if you're in Austin, sapiencenter.com, nosetail.org. Also the film, oh man, film, going well, going on a film tour. When this podcast releases, I will be on a film tour. We're grabbing Chris Masterjohn, Dr. Jamie Seaman, a couple other people. So go to foodlives.org, check that out there as well. Make sure you watch the intro. And now let's get onto the show with Dan. All right, Dan, hello, <laughs> how's it going? It's going well, it's going well, good to be here. Wow, I'm glad we got this mic working. We're doing this in person. If anyone's listening to this, check out the YouTube version of this on the Food Lies YouTube channel. But we had some mic problems, but we're going. We gotta yeah. get this going. <laughs> and uh, Dan, Dan Kitcher is here from the Bionutrient Food Association. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a talk with him at the Sapien Center tonight. Yeah. And we're gonna get you on stage. We're gonna have a potluck beforehand and get you up there and then ask some questions. So excited about that. Looking and forward to it, yeah. We're gonna do this podcast this morning to get us going. So you are all about nutrient density, so am I. Yeah. And I want you to explain to the audience why they should care about nutrient density to start this off. Like why should people even care about this before we even tell them what it is and all the background? Before we tell them what it is. Yeah, maybe, see if you can do that. <clears throat> um, why do you need to care about nutrient density? Uh, because it correlates directly to your level of vitality, vigor, um, life force, and groundedness. Um, yeah, the nutrient density of the food you eat, uh, you know, at some point in the relatively near future becomes the, you know, the coherence of the body that you occupy. And um, in many cases, what we have access to and consume um, does not have those things in it that our bodies need to function. And so then therefore we become less coherent. So let's take a step back then, because I talk about nutrient density a lot. Actually, mm -hmm. it's like one of my things that comes up on almost yeah. every episode. Weston Price also comes up on a lot of my episodes, but mm -hmm. he actually, the core of his research was nutrient density. He went around the world and found that the people, these healthy populations were eating super nutrient dense foods and even yeah. brought them back to the lab and tested them. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was like six to 10 times the vitamins and minerals in the food. Yeah. So, so let's, We'll keep going down levels on, on how that works and why there's some foods that are more nutrient dense than others. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a basically, so I, mean, I think it's good to just to define terms. Um, the oftentimes words get thrown around without, a, without a, like a, a specific context. In the history of food science, nutrient density is defined as, um, you know, levels, average levels of nutrients per calorie. And so, so kale, in, in traditional food science speak, kale is more nutrient dense than rice. Um, now that's not what we mean when we're talking about nutrient density right now. We're talking about a different, a different meaning of the word. When I grew up on an organic farm in the 1980s, um, <clears throat> organic meant contains carbon, like organic chemistry. Mm. And so when I told my science teacher in fourth grade that I was an organic farmer, she said, all farmers are organic because organic means contains carbon, mm -hmm. you silly child. And then in eighth grade, after there had been the, the LR scare, everybody knew that organic meant no chemicals. So with nutrient density, it's like that. The scientists, the food scientists, if you ask, if you ask them what nutrient density means, they say average nutrients per unit calorie. And they think all kale is uniform and all rice is uniform. And they say kale is more nutrient dense than rice. Now, what we're talking about is the differentiation between kale. Some kale has way more nutrients in it than other kale. Some rice has way more nutrients in it than other rice. And so um, what it comes down to is the way the, the way the food is grown, like effectively the health of the microbiome of the plant that was producing the food connects very, very nicely with the nutrient levels in the food. So when you use tillage and chemicals and fertilizer to produce crops, you get crops that have lots of volume, but very little nutrition. And when you don't, when you use, you know, when you work with nature and you have, you know, soil structure and polycultures and well-established microbiomes, then you get high levels of nutrients in that crop, which correlates with flavor and aroma and health-giving attribute and pest and disease resistance 
and soil carbon sequestration. And we think, you know, the dynamics that can reverse chronic illness in humans as well. Well, I very much agree. And we have to dive into each of those and also yeah. dive into your background a little more. Tell us more about how you grew up and... Will we start there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I grew up on an organic farm. Um, I grew up on a homestead. Um, my parents were, uh, they were community organizers in the urban inner city in Boston. Um, but then when they uh, started having a family, they thought they wanted to raise that family out in the land. And so they built a, <clears throat> you know, kind of a back to the land, pretty rustic. Um, it wasn't rustic because it was new, but it was a passive solar with a wood stove and a root cellar and a milk cow kind of, kind of life. Um, so. And their day job was um, running the local organic farming organization in the state. So my mother was the executive director of the state chapter organization, and my father was the editor of the journal for all seven state chapters, mm -hmm. and they ran the annual conference. Um, so I, I grew up in the organic movement, both as a you know homesteader, producer of food, but also in that cultural context that our house was the office for the whole for their whole organization. So. Um, you know, I, I have that I have that perspective, but um, when I got married and had found no better lifestyle to um, raise children in, I thought that the homestead on the land culture was the best one I'd been exposed to. That's what I wanted to do, um, and I had no other skills for making a living besides farming. I tried to make a living farming, and I rapidly realized that I couldn't because of the fact that I had pest pressure and disease pressure, which is oftentimes considered to be normal for farmers. Um, but that I thought about um, if all the plants in nature aren't being eaten alive by insects and, and decimated by disease, why are my plants in my in the field? You know, if organic is better, maybe because you aren't using chemicals, but still nature is taking out my plants or trying to with pests and diseases, if you can call them nature's report card, um, that I wasn't doing a good enough job for nature to be happy. Um, so. I started looking into the <clears throat> science, going reading books and going to conferences and things like that, and um, you know, rapidly realized that it's foundationally it's about creating a dynamic where the microbiome is functioning well, where the the, the bacteria and the fungi and the soil um, that are evolved to symbiotically work with the plants, you know, they're the ones that are the bottom of the food chain, and if you're doing things to the soil that is causing them to suffer, then the plant, which is the middle of the food chain, is going to suffer. So it's so it was really about creating a dynamic where soil health is functioning at a high level. Um, that makes it so that the crops are pest and disease resistant. That means the crops more flavorful and aromatic. It makes them more nutritious. It lowers my cost of production as a farmer. Um, it seems to increase soil carbon um, and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I got to a point where my Plants didn't have any pests and disease pressure, and I was making a good living, not working very hard. And I said, if I grew up on a farm and in the organic movement, and I didn't know any of these things, maybe other people don't know them also, and started giving workshops and teaching courses and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think we've been focusing, I founded the Biomachine Food Association in 2010. Um, you know, when I first got into this work in 2005, 2006, um, and started putting pieces together, I said, you know, what is the word for this thing that um, says this carrot is better than that carrot. Mm -hmm. And at least in the circles I was traveling in, there was no word for it. Mm -hmm. And there was not even much of a concept for it. So, you know, after some conversation with the elders sort of settled on this term nutrient density and started popularizing it. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a process. Um, but, um, yeah, but there's a, well, there's great. some background there. For you. No, that's amazing. It's always good to get your background you know, you've lived this your whole life, basically. You grew up with it. And maybe that's why, you're part of why I know the term nutrient density. It didn't exist before we started using it. Well, I'm, there I'm it is. Sure. That's amazing. I love it. I mean, that. we sort of took the word that was in food science and basically tried to have a new meaning for it. Like organic chemistry now, organic farming. Like, yeah, exactly. That's great. And it's a big topic in the film. We just asked, actually watched the intro to my series. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, yeah. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I want to watch it. Very compelling looking. That's the whole goal of that intro is yeah. get people interested. Yeah. Wake them up be like, hey, I got to take my health into my own hands. I got to wake up. If you don't, nature's, nature's, you know, I mean, you eat poorly and you're going to get 
<laughs> oh, I see what's going on. I think people can go go around the airport, go around the Costco, and you see what happens when people don't eat right. It's like yeah. I basically look, I have a different view of people when I look at them. Not I'm not like judging people so much by their size, but I just I sort of see people as the food you're eating is not getting along with you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like something's going wrong with the food you're eating and your body's responding. Well, you, I mean, as I understand it, you get a new body every six months. I mean, your bones take seven years and your blood takes two weeks, but on average you get a new body every, every six months. So you are being built out of that which you consume. And so if you are consuming junk, you become junk. I mean, it's, you consume vitality and you become vitality. It's, I mean, it's, it's not complicated. It's really no, quite I, simple. I believe it. And, and I'm not only talking about <laughs> obese people, cause you can be, yeah. you know, the you can be skinny, skinny and oh, incoherent. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. And you see these, yeah, it doesn't have to do with size. It has to do with vibrational coherence. Yeah. And yeah, I've seen these, I don't know, it was another documentary and it, it was like some guy in the middle of nowhere and he just drinks like 10 bottles of Mountain Dew a day. Yeah. Super skinny, look terrible, with bad teeth. Like yeah. it's not about size at all, Yeah. but it can be. And that's why I'm so obsessed with nutrient density. And that's why I want to start out why it's so important is because that's like the foundation that goes from the soil to the plants to you. And so yeah, let's go back to your breakdown. You said so many things about what nutrient density is and you know the, this whole chain that starts in the ground and the microbiome because I mostly on my show I talk about the human gut microbiome yeah but it goes deeper than that it starts so, in the soil yeah I mean I like to ask people which on which of the first six days did God invent fertilizer um, you know it's been hundreds of millions of years that plants have been doing just fine feeding themselves from the environment without the applications of fertilizer mm -hmm. and insecticides and fungicides. And so the fact that we are taught as farmers that we need to do these things, you know, in my perspective has a lot to do with who's selling us which products. Um, we have the um, experience of indigenous cultures globally working in a very profound way with nature to create high levels of vitality and system function you know, when the Europeans first came here to the Americas, um, they were blown away at the amount of game in the in the fields and the forests and the fish in the streams and the food everywhere and just the the, the the vitality of the ecosystem. And they're like, this is a garden of Eden. Like, mm -hmm. how did this magically happen? Well, it didn't magically happen. It was a very conscious, proactive, subtle and sensitive engagement with the entire continent that the people who were living here were doing. And so, foundationally, plants have evolved like animals <clears throat> um, to, I mean, plants can't digest their food, we can't digest our food, right? We understand it's the people inside of us that digest our food for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have internal digestive tracts, plants have external digestive tracts, and um, yeah, so um, it's, 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 a, it's a foundational piece of the puzzle. The plants are green, they make green leaves, they have green leaves, they make sugar, and oxygen. The oxygen goes into the atmosphere, the sugar goes into the soil to feed the microbes. The microbes are the ones that digest the soil, that digest the atmosphere, and feed those nutrients to the plant. And so that's that's the way life evolved it to work. And when you have a dynamic where the microbes aren't doing well, that system is broken, the plants aren't getting the nutrients they need, you can jack them up with soluble nutrients. Like you can keep a person alive on, a, on an IV drip mm -hmm. for years, right? You get soluble nutrients directly into their bloodstream, you can keep them alive but um, you can take steroids and you get big, big muscles, right? But that doesn't make you healthy. That doesn't make you vibrant and vital and have a strong immune system and everything else. And so um, a lot of that which is passes for food um, is sold on the shelves of stores, um, foundationally does not have the nutrients in it that it could or should based on the fact that the way it was produced um, was in a way that where nature was not supported and functioning well. So um, the nutritional value of food seems to correlate directly with flavor for us, aroma for us, and soil health. Those compounds that correlate with health giving attributes, the secondary metabolites, the polyphenols and antioxidants and terpenoids, those are the things that are that um, your plants can only build in high levels when all the rest of the system is functioning well. So. I use the example of a tomato on the shelf in February 
you know, having a different flavor than a tomato off a vine in August, um, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. People have had that experience as an animal. You know what a, a tomato could taste like and a tomato most often tastes mm -hmm. like. That's your inbuilt nutrient monitoring system telling you this one's good and that one's not. Right? We still are animals with animal instinct. 30% of our DNA is associated with the function of our nose and our tongue. We're wired to discern you know, the relative value of things through flavor. If you eat a peach off a tree that's like amazing and you eat a peach off a shelf that's not, it doesn't matter if it's certified organic, it doesn't matter if it's local, if it doesn't have that flavor, foundationally it doesn't have that nutrition. So um, it's all actually quite intuitive and simple. We can get fancy with the science and the meters and the numbers and everything else, but I mean. <laughs> uh, I, we could do both. I love yeah. doing both actually, because so, so much of health and, and being a nutritious human is instincts and natural. And that's, we're talking about, I went to Africa a couple yeah. years ago and I found that it's like, they didn't have the fancy, they didn't have a gauge like you have no. there. They didn't have anything, but they knew. Have you heard of this guy, Mark Schatzker? The absolutely. Author? Yeah. Absolutely. We had so, a keynote at our conference a couple years ago. Okay. I assumed you would, cause you're talking about flavor and aroma and like yeah. all this stuff. And also I had Fred Favenza on my show, yeah, which of course, brilliant. you know, had on Stefan Von Vliet. Yep. Who we goes into, with. Yes. Exact. Well, t like these are, you guys are like the, the Marvel superheroes of, the, <laughs> <laughs> of bringing this all together. You know, it's like the, what is it called? Like the dream team. I just switched to basketball all of a sudden, but yeah. The Avengers. Uh, I, I, yeah, either density. one has a generally positive uh, <laughs> connotation to this culture. But yeah, so yeah. to well, before we get to the scientific side, because you guys do do some really cool science, is mm -hmm. the I like the instinctual side, and that's what we talked about with Fred Benza and the yeah. animal studies or Mark Schatzker. We're talking about we used to just know, like we could in instinctively know what was good nutrition, mm -hmm. and we've totally lost that. I don't think we've lost it. I don't think we've lost it. I think when you take a three-year-old and you give them a good carrot and they taste it, they want more of it. I think when you give a, an adult a good peach and they taste it, they want more of it. I don't mm. think we've lost it. Mm. I just think we don't have access to it. Mm. I think the vast majority of what's on the shelves today is more properly called junk than food. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't put those two words together. We should, we should differentiate between junk and food. It's a continuum and most of what's available I mean, I'm not talking about Doritos and Snickers and things like that. I'm talking about, because that's obviously junk. Oh, exactly. That doesn't count. Like, yeah. don't take the food part off of that and mm -hmm. call it junk. Like, mm -hmm. just name it what it is. But from a continuum of what, you know, this tomato has in it versus that tomato, if this tomato is in the 20th percentile of what tomato could be, and this one's in the 80th percentile, call that one junk and call that one food. Like, let's begin to mm -hmm. differentiate. The problem is, as we've shown through our research over the last five years, when you take crops off the shelf from around the country, grocery stores, farmers markets, wherever they are, other countries, other continents, the vast majority of food has in it about 20 or 30% of what it could, right? If you were going to college and getting a final exam and your final exam was a, a 30, you'd be a failure. If we understand the potential of what a carrot could be, and most carrots are at the 30th percentile, that means most food is a failure. Most mm -hmm. food is junk, relatively speaking to what it could be. And it's not that we've lost the ability to discern, it's that we know that most of the things that are look like they're natural aren't compelling to us. We don't know why they're not compelling to us. It's because they're not, <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. our bodies are like, this is not compelling. I don't want to eat that carrot, it's bitter. Mm -hmm. That tomato does not you know, leave me feeling vital and vibrant and excited, you know, so. Yes, yeah, we actually, our instincts are telling us, it's just that everything is bad yeah. from what's available to you at the fancy fancy stores and the other stores. And so, yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, that is <clears throat> true. Yeah, humans still have it. Yeah, just most people, like our food environment is so bad that they won't even, they're just so out of the picture. They're just eating what the TV told them to eat. Or they just show up and there's like, oh, well, 80% of the store is just this packaged food and I like the taste of this. And I just keep eating it. Which Mark Shasker's work about, you know, I mean, with the Dorito effect, right? He was uh -huh. talking about all these synthetic flavorings, salt, sugar, fat, all these synthetic flavorings that are used to trick the, the taste buds so that you say, I want to eat that. But then if you talk to your body afterwards and you say, how do I feel after I ate that? You know, like, Bleh. well, mm -hmm. that's the answer. Did you really want to eat that? Because if you felt Bleh afterwards, or maybe you're just so used to it, you don't even know, because that's what mm -hmm. everything you eat makes you feel. I don't know. 
I think most people yeah, don't know what feeling good feels like. But feels you like see, energized after eating as opposed to being heavy and tired. Exactly. Yeah. And now people I know, we know the difference. That's why it's actually not even like willpower. It's not like I have to use willpower to not eat Doritos. It's like I just know that like, I don't want to. I don't want to. People offer me dessert. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. Want some ice cream? No, not really. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Want some dessert? No. Talk for it. I'll pass. Uh-huh. Unless someone makes, yeah, someone makes it from scratch. A proper, yeah. Yeah, and it is like a nutrient dense like. Tara Couture, mm-hmm. this amazing woman who does homesteading and stuff, she made, I went up there on my birthday a couple of years ago for the film, she made me the most amazing dessert of my life because yeah. she made it with her duck egg yolks yeah. and her dairy cow that exactly. she raised and she put care in it and she yeah. didn't load it with sugar, she put right. a little bit of maple syrup in it. Perfect. It was amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, you're doing work to actually quantify this, you measure, you know, you're giving us scales like 20 to 80%, tell us more about like the carrot that can be a 20 or could be an 80. So, yeah, I mean, we started, you know, the organization by an Nutrition Food Association in 2010 with a mission to increase quality in the food supply. And our, and our thought was, you know, what can we do to cause the ambient level of food next year to be higher than it is this year, nutrient levels to be higher next year than this mm-hmm. year. Um, and then the year after that, higher than, than mm-hmm. next year. And so, that's our sort of vision is, you know, or our mission is to work to create a reality where food is more nutritious, um, full stop, and globally, right? This is mm-hmm. not for North American context, this is for the global context. And so um, <clears throat> initially as a small organization, our work was in education uh, with producers, growers of all sizes, sort of workshops, courses, conferences, um, local chapters, things like that. Um, and as, as the, we sort of grew and spread around the country and in other countries, um, it, you know, it became clear that these principles of working with nature seemed to be true. That it didn't matter what the climate zone was or the soil type or the crop type or whatever, like wheat, carrots, apples, echinacea, you know, north, south, east, west, dry, wet, like in all climates, working with nature like with working to establish a well-functioning microbiome has these concomitant benefits of increasing soil carbon, increasing farm vitality, decreasing um, toxin loads, decreasing pest and disease pressure, increasing ecosystem function, increasing um, flavor, aroma, shelf life, nutrient levels. We're like, oh my God, you know, we could solve some serious problems like climate problems and health problems if we could figure out a way to get this to happen more. So how can we do that? And, and the thought was, um, you know, money seems to be a powerful vector in today's cultural reality. People make decisions based on economics. And so if we could align economic self-interest with ecological self-interest and health self-interest, if we could figure out a way to get those things working together, that could be you know, we get a, a plausible scenario to actually have a system a systemic effect. And so the thought was, you know, how do you do that? You know, you give people the ability to, at point of purchase, choose between, like, if they've got three jugs of milk to choose from, or three bags of carrots to choose from, or three options for a steak, or, I mean, I don't care what you eat. I don't, I'm personally, I'm entirely agnostic about what the food is, mm. like, whether you're a vegetarian or a vegan or an omnivore or carnivore or a, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter to me the question is whatever it is you're ingesting it should be of the highest caliber available so we'll just use carrots as an example I use you know bunny love and Cal organic and both house farms so you got three bags of carrots to choose from um, if you knew that one of those was at the 20th percentile of what a carrot could be one of them was at the 40th percentile of what a carrot could be and one was at the 80th percentile and that one was at the 80th percentile had you know more nutrients but better flavor. Like, and you could choose one of those three bags off the shelf. Which one would you choose? I mean, my thought is people are going to probably choose the 80 over the 20 mm-hmm. if they have that option, if they have that, if they have that knowledge. And so, that was our idea: was you know give anybody who wants to the ability to make purchasing decisions based on inherent nutritional value. Ignore the labeling, ignore the marketing, ignore the certifications. It's not about organic or local or biodynamic or regenerative or nothing. It's about nutritional value because we have 
some organic farmers doing a great job and some organic farmers doing a crappy job mm -hmm. and some local farmers doing a great job and some local farmers doing a crappy job. It doesn't matter. You know, we have a continuum mm -hmm. in all these dynamics and it's about the nutritional value because that's what connects to the soil health and the human health and the flavor. Um, so this was 2016 or so when we set about doing this project and um, we identified three things we wanted to do. One was to characterize the nutritional variation because there's no data set globally which says this is the biochemical you know, signature of a high quality carrot, the biochemical signature of a low quality carrot and everything in between. No, no one's built that data set globally, nowhere. There's no data set which says this is the variation within carrots, this is the variation within beef, variation within milk, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. And so one thing you have to do, if we're gonna be able to say this is 80, this is 20, is to de define what, mm -hmm. <laughs> what the continuum is. The second thing is to build a meter which can be used at point of purchase to perceive directly. So flash a light at the carrots, 20, 40. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, labeling and marketing and certification schemes are, um, they're generally binary. Um, like you are organic or you're not organic. Mm. They don't necessarily connect to nutritional value and they're, but they're not a continuum. So food quality is a continuum. Some stuff is really bad. Some stuff is really good. And most stuff is somewhere in the middle. Is it the 20 or the 40 or the 80? We don't know. So giving people the ability to flash a light at something and get a reading in real time, that was a second sort of step. So what is quality? You know, then can you assess it in real time? And then third was um, what causes it? Which management practices, which fertility programs, which climate dynamics, which uh, soil types, which varieties? What are the things that farmers can do to do a better job? Because as an organization, we're basically, we're founding, our, we're growers at our core. And the last thing we want to do is have growers, you know, produce a crop and have the buyer say, we don't want it. What we want to do is have the growers empowered to produce the highest quality crop which the, the buyers are going to offer them a premium for, um, which is going to increase their economic viability because that's what's going to drive the transition is farmers making a better living doing the right thing. Right now, they make a better living doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. The system is set up to facilitate that. And so they're going to keep doing the wrong thing until they get a, make a better living doing the right thing. Um, so we started this project in yeah, 2016 conceptually, 2017 built the first meter um, and the specs for the meter where it had to be handheld, consumer priced, um, flash of light, non-invasive, and open source, because mm. we want this to be in the commons and not controllable by a economic interest, mm. right? We don't want this to be black boxed, you know, weakened over time. We want it to be sort of stay in the commons. So 2017 built the first meter, 2018 built the first lab, tested the first couple crops, um, carrots and spinach it was, and you had people send in samples from all over the country. Um, Farmers markets, grocery stores, uh, you know, organic, not organic, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I mean, the variations were like three <clears throat> x, five x, ten x, fifteen x on the minerals, mm -hmm. as in like this carrot has as much calcium in it as those three carrots, or this leaf of spinach has as much iron in it as those fifteen leaves of spinach, which is you know, not a small amount of yeah. <laughs> variation, three x to fifteen x on minerals, and then when we looked at polyphenols and antioxidants. Mm -hmm. The sort of the more complex compounds, the flavor compounds and things, it was more like 75 to 1 or 200 to 1. Mm. It was, that was the range we found. Top to bottom was 75 to 1, 200 to 1. Um, so anyway, and that's continued. So 2019, we built our second lab, worked with six crops, worked, started working with farmers, um, had them report their management data, send in the soil so we could look at the soil carbon and the biological activity as well as the mineral levels. Um, 2020, we had our third lab, looked at 25 different crops um, in Europe, so we're trying to get samples from Europe as well. Um, and then as of last year, 2021, we had enough data to calibrate the handheld meter and release it to the public. So now people can literally go to a grocery store, flush one zucchini, and get a reading on like the levels of nutrients in this one versus that one, or carrots, or wheat berries, or mustard greens, or whatever. So um, That's amazing. That's amazing. But does it go to animal food? Does it go to meat? Yet. Yes. Yet. Um, we are a nonprofit educational organization. Our, all of our work is, um, is done in the commons um, on donations. So because we don't want this thing to be controlled by a profit-making endeavor, um, we are not 
there's no opportunity for investment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we only there's only an opportunity for donation, and so that basically is limiting the speed at which we're able to accomplish this broader objective. Um, as of last year, 2021, we did start working with beef um, and doing it in a much more comprehensive way of assessing. The, the previous 25 crops we looked at, it was 15 elements and three compounds. So copper, zinc, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, polyphenols, antioxidants, protein. Those are like all understood to be valuable and relevant. And so we can say, the meter right now can say on carrots, like you've got higher calcium and potassium and polyphenols, mm -hmm. or you're in the 80th percentile of these things. So what we're saying is for these compounds or these elements, you're in the 80th percentile, but that's different than saying this is a better carrot or a worse carrot. To be able to say confidently, this is a better carrot or a worse carrot, we think, you know, requires a deeper assessment of what's called metabolomics. Um, and this is what we're doing with Stefan Van Vliet at Utah State mm -hmm. is with the beef project is we're looking at 750 different compounds and elements. So vitamins, enzymes, lipids, amino acids, terpenoids, phenolics, minerals, like hundreds of different elements mm -hmm. and compounds. Some health beneficial, some health detrimental. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at stress hormones and inflammation markers and pre-diabetic biochemistry in the beef, along with the omega-6, omega-3 ratio, along mm -hmm. with the polyphenols, antioxidants. I may be speaking too fast with all kinds of big fancy oh, words. I think my crowd knows all these terms. If your word, if your community knows this, I'll keep all these going, terms. Keep going at full speed. Terms we brought up before. So, yeah, the idea is depending on whether that cow is, you know, stressed out, eating bad food, getting no exercise, like, <laughs> or out in the pasture with his family, running around having fun, mm -hmm. like what's in its meat varies dramatically, and so. Um, what we've done so far in the first 25 crops, the roots, the leaves, the fruits, and the grains, we say is nutrient variation. So we can say these nutrients vary. That's different than saying nutrient density, this is better, this is worse. Mm -hmm. And so we think we're just now beginning to be able to say what is nutrient density in the first crop. Until now, everybody throws the word around, but we don't actually have an empirical data set to you know, <clears throat> refer to. Like, it's one of my critiques Having been in the food movement basically for 40 years, um, I see these buzzes and the isms and mm -hmm. the, you know, like local was a big thing and you know, um, regenerative is a big thing right now. And I mean, there's a, there's these, there's these sort of these movements that come and go and, and people start jumping on the bandwagon using the word and there's no actual definition of the word. So anybody can make the claim and then what does it mean? Mm -hmm. I mean regenerative is one right now that's like, it's, there's a bunch of great impulse behind it, but there's a bunch of, greenwashing interest behind it as well. And so with nutrient density, our thought is if we can define the term and we can say this steak is in the 80th percentile of what a steak could be, and this is in the 20th percentile, then that's what you claim. You don't claim nutrient density per se. You say, oh, the continuum of what steaks could be, we've assessed this one, and this is at the 80th percentile, mm -hmm. and this was at the 40th percentile, because um, yeah, we like, you know, I'm not sure we like, but it's sort of, it's very normal in this cultural context to have this black and white sort of bifurcation, yeah. which is not how nature works. So we hope that by the end of 2022, we have our first preliminary definition of nutrient density in beef. Um, mm -hmm. and we'll probably finalize it by next year. Um, and then we move on to other crops. Mm -hmm. um, do pork and, and chicken, do oats and wheat, do soybeans and mm -hmm. chickpeas. I mean, um, but it takes money and scientific rigor um, but our thought is if we can bring that sort of rigor to the supply chain and we can empower consumers to make decisions based on this variation, um, that will profoundly shift the incentives in, the, in, the, in agriculture. So where we're at right now with our meter with nutrient variation is that you know we're looking to raise money this fall, but if we're successful or as we are successful, you know, imagine this reality where um, 12 months from now, uh, You've got 10 people living here in Austin that each have a handheld spectrometer mm -hmm. um, and they each once a week go shopping at a different store. Um, so 10 people in town that each shop, one's at Whole Foods, one's at Trader Joe's, one's at Target, one's at the local farmer's market. I don't know what the options are here, mm -hmm. but something, Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, and they spend an extra 20 minutes every week when they're shopping, being a citizen scientist, doing their, doing their you know, democratic duty of, of actual you know, grounded action. And that is to take the meter and flash a light at every single one of the potato options in the store 
every apple option, every cucumber option. They're literally flashing a light at every different crop that's in the store and that reading goes into the cloud. And then everybody in Austin has access to that data. So you know where the best blueberries are in town this week. Mm -hmm. You know where the best apples are in town this week. And our thought is, if we can do that and everybody in town has access to that information, maybe you get 100 or 1,000 people to all go and buy out the best blueberries in town and then they all go out and buy out the best carrots mm -hmm. in town and they buy out the best apples in town. Like, our thought is, I mean, we're not very far from being able to have that be a reality mm -hmm. on hundreds of cities, thousands of cities globally. That, you know, 10 active people in a, in a, in a region can provide the information to everybody to understand where the best stuff is so they can go and get it and pull it off the shelf. We're not focused on where the worst stuff is, we're focused mm -hmm. on where the best stuff is because we want people to access the best stuff, mm -hmm. remove that, and send the signal to the supply chain to pull that from the farmers. Well, that creates demand and creates a higher value. This, yeah. it goes to the incentives that are misaligned that we were talking about before. Well, I can talk about the healthcare system or the sick care system more. Yeah. Incentives are completely misaligned. There's no incentive to make someone healthier. Right. There's more of an incentive to sell people prescription drugs and surgeries. Right. So with food, it's actually inverse. The incentives are to get more volume of food, not yeah. more nutrients in right. food. So we can fight the problem, which, I mean, I certainly spent a lot of my 20s being very angry at about all the world's problems and trying to fight this and fight this and fight this. Or we can try to build a solution. And our thought is, like, let's build the reality we want to see. And, you know, what, what touches more than food? Food touches the environment. It touches health. It touches coherence and consciousness. I mean, I, I suggest that basically we are, um, all of our systems of the culture, you know, politics, economics, you know, media, are made out of people. Right? There's people that are in the political system, people that are in the economic system, people that are in the media system that are all basically building their bodies out of and have for maybe a couple generations insufficient quality food. And we're basically vibrating at a low level. Our, 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 our underlying coherence is poor. And so we're, our thoughts are incoherent, our actions are incoherent, our incentives, like we are actually, you know, vibrating out of tune as people, and therefore we're making decisions and actions in the world that are out of tune. And so this is, I call it a spiritual covert op. Mm. If we get food quality to be better, every six months people get a new body, people become more coherent by just simply ingesting better quality food. They are then more able to tune into and ground their higher natures and take those actions in their daily lives. So. Yeah, our proposal is mm -hmm. by simply facilitating a reality where people can access better quality food, a number of systemic issues become addressed. Beyond the fact that it's only through working with nature that you sequester the carbon and build the ecosystem function that reverses climate change, right? I mean, minor point. People mm -hmm. at this point will get and start finally getting a little bit worked up about it. Like, agriculture is the way we can, I mean, your community knows this, powerfully, positively affect ecological dynamics and health. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a big one. <laughs> we can turn things around pretty quick. It's, um, yeah, anyway. Well, no, it's amazing. That's like the biggest, best mission I've heard in a while, like actually raising the entire food system of the world and increase it each year. Increasing quality in the food supply. That's our, the BFA's mission, increasing quality in the food supply. If we simply do that, any number of other things will, will be addressed as part of that process. I, yes. It's kind of amazing because, yeah, if you're nutritionally deficient, and I've seen it in people where, yeah, incoherent is a good term for what their life is. It's their brain isn't really functioning. dissonant. They're vibrating out of tune. I mean, we can go into the quantum mechanics and the metaphysics and the biochemistry and the biophysics. I mean, mm -hmm. the, yeah, it's <laughs> no, it's real. No, I've seen it. People's brains just don't work right. And yeah, so well, okay, let's go into the the technology part because we were talking about shining a light. And that might not make sense to people. And I want to yeah. know the difference between what Stefan Van Vliet, he's talking about the, <coughs> I, he, I, don't, I don't remember if it's 40,000 secondary compounds or up to 70,000 secondary compounds. And this equipment he uses, he's using like giant equipment in a lab and like, can you get that in this little meter that you have? Right, so. And what is it, spectron, is, we're using what, is, what is spectroscopy? Yeah. 
how the hell can you flush into something <laughs> yes. and see what it is? It sounds like magic. It sounds like Star Trek. It sounds like it's a ray gun or a tricorder, right? I mean, um, so yeah, I'd like to use the example of um, of astrophysics, which is you know kind of like biochemistry. It's one of those things that sounds fancy and it's hard to understand. But um, if you ask an astrophysicist, which most people wouldn't, but if I mean say theoretically you did, what is Alpha Centauri made up of? And Alpha Centauri is the star that's closest to us, which is mm -hmm. not the sun, which is only like five or six light years away. It's not very far away. Cons I mean, in relation to other things that we mm -hmm. are looking at with our you know amazing telescopes and things. Um, but it is a few light years away, and the 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 probe, the, like the thing that NASA has sent off that's gone the farthest away from Earth, is like eighteen light hours away, right? The Voyager One and Voyager Two that got sent off in nineteen seventy seven are the things that have gone farthest away from Earth, mm. and they're 18 light hours away from us right now. Three quarters of a day. Alpha Centauri is light years away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a it's a ways further than anything we've ever sent off of Earth. And yet, if you ask an astrophysicist, what is it made up of? They're like 51% hydrogen, 48% helium, 1% other the gases, these levels and ratios. Next, mm -hmm. like that's that we figured that out a long time ago. And you're like, how the hell do you know? what something light years away is made up of if you've never been there. And it's through this science called spectroscopy, which basically is that um, every element in chemistry is a vibration in physics. So copper is a, it's a quote unquote a thing in chemistry, but it's a vibration in physics. It vibrates at a certain frequency. Zinc is a thing in, in, in chemistry. It's a vibration in physics. It vibrates a little bit differently. That vibration is light. And so effectively what spectroscopy is, is we take a picture of the light coming off of Alpha Centauri and you parse it out really closely and you can see how much of it is the vibration of hydrogen, how much is the vibration of helium, how much is the vibration of copper or zinc. And you can basically say, this is what Alpha Centauri is made up of. So <clears throat> our thought is, if you can understand what something light years away is made up of by reading its light, then maybe you can understand what something a millimeter Mm -hmm. away is made up of by reading its light. So that's all we're doing is basically taking a, a science, a technology that's decades old and saying, let's apply it here on the physical plane in the real world in like an actual, in, in a cultural context. And so, yeah, the spectrometer we built, um, like I said, it's open source, which means um, the specs are online. It's on GitHub. You know, if you want to build one, they're there. You can download it. If you want to sell them, you can make lots of them and sell them. We are this is open source. This is not a company. This is in the commons. And so what it is, it's got 10 little LEDs in there that flash lights at different frequencies um, from ultraviolet through visible to infrared. Um, and as we've been working over the last number of years to have samples sent into the lab of soil and crops, we've had one of these meters in the lab. And so every time the soil comes in, we flash a light at it first and take a picture of that speckle signature <clears throat> and then we do the lab work and say, okay, it's got this much organic matter, this much copper and zinc and sulfur and calcium. And the same with the crops. When the crop comes in, we, we flash a light at it with this meter, we take a picture of the spectral signature, and then we run it through the lab work and we do polyphenols, antioxidants, copper, zinc. And so we built a fairly large database um, of these spectral signatures overlaid on nutrient levels. And so now, you know, with basically AI and, and algorithms, we are able to say, now you put a, a zucchini on here, you flush light at it, and it, it back calibrates from the data set we've got and says, looks like the polyphenol levels are in the 84th percentile of what a zucchini could be. So um, that's that's basically it. No, that's a great breakdown. And that, so the stuff that with meat, is it use the same technology or? So, so yeah, I mean, so, um, what we're doing with meat now is looking at way more compounds. Mm. So we're looking at 750 different compounds. Um, and we haven't, as of yet, had this meter in the process at the lab at Utah State. Our thought is that this meter we've got right now, I call it an Apple II. For those who know what an Apple II was, it was sort of like the first personal computer. Prior to that, computers were in the basements of universities. And if you lived in a mm -hmm. university town, you could want to be a coder. and. If you didn't, you didn't have access to mm -hmm. them. And then <clears throat> there came a time when you could have a computer in your house and it was pretty janky. If you weren't a coder, it didn't work. Or maybe it had Frogger, but nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. It was a pretty rudimentary thing. Then there was a Macintosh. 
then there was the MacBook, then there was the iPhone, mm -hmm. right? This is an Apple II. This is not an iPhone. Mm -hmm. And so our thought is generationally, what we're doing with Stefan, with beef, with hundreds of different metabolites, is gonna be building a definition of nutrient density, which is a level beyond where we're at right now. This is, a, this is nutrient variation. We can say copper and zinc and polyphenols are higher or lower, which for the next three years is better than anything else you're gonna be able to have access to. But after that, we're gonna be able to say nutrient density on this beef, nutrient density on this wheat, nutrient density on this milk. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't calibrate a meter to nutrient density until we've defined what nutrient density is. If it costs us a million dollars to do one crop, beef's a million bucks. Maybe <clears throat> maybe pork will be 750 and chicken and lamb will be about 500 mm -hmm. grand. But wheat will be a million, then oats are 750, then mm -hmm. rice and rye are 500. <clears throat> it's gonna take some millions of dollars to define nutrient density per crop. And only once we've done that, can we begin to back calibrate an instrument to assess that. So. I'm not sure that all makes sense. It does. So it's an iterative process and we're on the track, but we're not, we haven't arrived or. Yeah. We got, we got, we got some work left to do. Sounds like my documentary <laughs> series. And the money, it d dictates the speed. Uh, my, my brother's a contractor. He says, there's three things. You got speed, quality, and cost. Mm -hmm. You want it done quickly. If it's okay, if it's crappy, it doesn't have to cost too much. But if you want it to be quickly, done quickly and done well, it's gonna cost you money. Yeah. Um, so we're committed to quality. Um, and so then the question is, it'll happen fast if we have more money, it'll take longer time if we have less money. Yeah. And that's where we're at. Can you back check this reference range with other technologies? So it's like, okay, we know this and then test the nutrients in a different way and then see if it lines up with this spectroscopy. I am fairly certain. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but yeah. But just, no, I'm just wondering, it's like how to calibrate. It's mainly like how to calibrate this stuff. And you're checking yes. nutrient levels in one, in, in one way. And I'm just wondering if you can check them in a different way too. There's a number of instruments out there that can be used. Most of them are lab bench instruments. There's not a lot of them out there that are, that are sort of consumer yeah. prices and, and size. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, you have to, Whatever it is that you're working with has to have the inherent capacity, but mm -hmm. certainly you can calibrate across instruments. I mean, if we want to look at the future of what this could be in five years or 10 mm -hmm. years, um, you know, ideally these sensors are in smartphones. Uh, ideally, Apple's putting them on their phone, Samsung's putting them on their phone, you know, Google's putting them on mm -hmm. their phone. Um, and yeah, we're a nonprofit. Our objective is not to be an instrumentation company. Mm -hmm. Our thought is that it's the, um, it's the definition of nutrient density that we care most about and that we want to stay open and honest and transparent. And so <clears throat> if we do have a situation next year where there are thousands of these, these meters out around the world um, being used by 10 people in any given city, like I talked about earlier, maybe that will inspire Apple to look at putting a spectrometer into their next iPhone and Google into putting one in their next pixel or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. um, at which point we're going to say, awesome, how can we work with you to help you, you know, get this because, you know, getting spectrometers into phones is going to facilitate this larger objective. But what we're also going to say is if you calibrate that spectrometer to a, a data set that we think is dishonest, we're going to tell the world about it. Mm. Yeah. Um, Cause right now, you know, Amazon owns Whole Foods, and the reality is that oftentimes what's at Walmart is as good as or better than what's at Whole Foods from a nutritional standpoint, then Amazon doesn't necessarily want people to know that. And so they might, you know, with their, I don't know, what's the Kindle, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. have, a, have, a, have a spectrometer and an algorithm that's, dis that's dishonest. Mm -hmm. And so if Google and Apple are being honest and Amazon's not, then, it's our, it's our position as leaders in this space to say, you know, trust this one, don't trust that one. And if we can hold that integrity in the space, bring it on. Let's have all these companies building meters, let's have all profiting off of it. Let's have farmers profiting off of doing a better, better job. If everybody makes more money doing the right thing, that's gonna cause the right thing to happen more fast. But there has to be some integrity at the center, which is not controlled, and not owned. Um, it's kind of like the Linux kernel, mm -hmm. right? You've got Red Hat, which is making lots of money, 
with Linux software, but the Linux kernel is held in the commons. Mm. Um, you do need that. that. No, that's great that you guys are the impartial third party, you guys are the nonprofit, and you're kind of saying the more data, the better. We're talking about calibrating and defining what nutrient density is, and it's great that you guys aren't just saying, we already know that, and this is what it is. And, in fact, and anybody I, who claims nutrient density, I say, show me the data upon which you make your claims. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's a word that does not have an empirical definition yet. Mm -hmm. And and one of the mistakes, this is sort of just a, uh, just a it's a common mistake, is saying you are or you are not. Mm -hmm. Like you are nutrient dense or you're not nutrient dense. I say, show me healthy and not healthy, right? There's a continuum. Mm -hmm. I'm at 70% vitality, I'm at 30% vitality. Like, like there's, it's not like you're healthy or unhealthy. It just, yeah. it's, it's a common, it's a, it's just a, it's a, it's a wrong way of thinking. Um, well, it's kind of like a shortcut. Yeah, like humans, we just want the easy answer and shortcuts all the time, black and white. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe in this Western cultural framework, I don't think it's a human thing per se. I think some humans actually appreciate nuance, and it's not. Yeah. It's like human nature. People are like, oh, human nature is a bad thing. It's no, the, human nature is an amazing thing. It's just yeah. what the dynamics we're existing in. You know, it's interesting. I think it's because we're used to these small tribes, like. And there's Dunbar's number, like 150 people. Yeah. If you're so once in that framework, we can appreciate nuance and precisely. But precisely. now we're overloaded, and there's too many people. There's too many things going on, so we kind of have to have black and white thinking because there's 1,000 different types of, like even phones to buy. You don't mm -hmm. even know what phone to buy because there's too much information. There's too many options. Yeah, it is certainly overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but I think if we can take responsibility for some of these concepts. Um, and model a way of engaging that is more nuanced and have that be the structure around which we coalesce, perhaps, you know, other aspects of culture can work that way too. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, uh, anyway. Okay, so how do we, when we were talking about Fred Povenza and Stefan Van Vliet, we were going from the soil to the plants to the animals. And mm -hmm. we kind of talked about that, but I want to just make sure, we, I don't know if you guys are looking at that yet, so maybe, you're not the right person to ask, but like how the nutrient density of the plants that the animals eat will provide better meat. Uh, categorically, so with the beef project, you know, the farmer, this is, we're doing this globally, so we're, our target is 200 farms or ranches planet-wide that are taking part in the project. Uh, each one sends in three steaks, mm -hmm. one for each of three different animals from a herd, mm -hmm. um, and um, they also send in the fecal materials, so we're assessing microbiome, mm -hmm. looking at, like I said, you know, 750 or more nutrients, compounds and elements, um, over 200 different families and species of microbes, multiple kingdoms, um, from the fecal material. Then we're assessing the forage, or whatever it is that the animal's eating, if it's the TMR or the forage, if it's a monoculture forage or it's a polyculture forage, then the soil that that, that food was produced on and then we also ask a number of questions about the life of the animal, what the, what the species was, how old, when it was born, how it was managed, you know, up until 18 months old it did this, and then for the last six months it did that. So we're getting that metadata for mm -hmm. the life of the animal. We're assessing the soil that its food was produced in, we're assessing the food it ate, we're assessing the microbiome of its gut, and then we're assessing the biochemistry of the meat. Mm -hmm. And we're overlaying these things all on top of each other. And then finally, it's actually human health trials. So who the hell are we to say what's right or wrong? We need to look at what nature says, like these are the biochemical levels and ratios that correlate with this human health effect, right? It's not like we can say, this is nutrient density, that's nutrient density. It's we have to use science to discern what nature's showing us. We hide behind science. We have our hypotheses about what's right and what's wrong. But really, you know, if it's true that these things cause you to be healthier, we should see those results in human mm -hmm. bodies. Um, and we should see the results in the microbiome of the animal, because we know what species in the microbiome are signs of health and poor health, we know what stress hormones look like, and we know what polyphenols look like, so, I mean, we pretty much know what the answer is, because there's all this data here and there and everywhere, but what this project is doing is basically putting it all into one project. So it's not like it's this piece is here and that piece is there, it's all actually mm -hmm. in one thing. Um, so, yeah. Sounds like you guys have a lot of data scientists trying to pull in a lot of numbers together. It's a real pain in the butt, but you know, if we're, I mean, if, if science is like the lingua franca of our time, if like the, 
if honest science, not dogmatic, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, which is not science, it's more dogma, religion, but if if we can agree that that science is a is a framework through which we can have a conversation, um, then let's let's do it. Let's own it. You know, if it only costs a million dollars for a crop, mm -hmm. which is nothing compared, I mean, so we're starting with beef because beef is the crop, the food stuff that has the largest economic footprint. More more dollars, euros, yen, whatever are spent on beef than anything else globally, and um, it's the largest ecological footprint. More land area is used in the production of beef than any other crop so if it takes a million dollars to be able to say this is great beef this is horrible beef and this is in the middle mm -hmm. and that is true for the entire planet then we can shift the way that all that land is managed mm -hmm. and all that you know money is directed um yeah what's a what's a what's a little bit of a hassle with some data <laughs> yeah <laughs> to have a profound well, opportunity which can shift things I love that, and I love that you mentioned the difference. Like, I, I saw a little documentary on Whole Foods versus like Walmart, and then mm. they could have just the same foods. Just Whole Foods cost twice as much. Uh, there are other groups who have been doing work looking at these kinds of things, and they have specifically done some of this data. And um, in many cases, what they've shown is that you know the quality, nutritional levels of food at Whole Foods is, is lower than the nutritional value of food at Walmart. And I mean, it isn't always the case, yeah. but in some cases it is the case. And so, yeah, um, I mean, and they, and they said the foundational reason was because of the speed of the supply chain. If they're both getting the same blueberries off the same packing house, you know, the same in, in mm. Oregon or whatever, and whatever, they're all, you know, at the 20th percentile of what a blueberry could be to begin with, but the Walmart supply chain takes five days and the whole food supply chain takes nine days, then as degradation occurs, the Whole Foods ones have degraded more than the, than the Walmart ones have degraded. And so um, the important point being there that what they have access to in the supply chain is still relatively poor to begin with. So if you start at 90 out of 100, like that's a whole different conversation, but they're both starting at 20 because mm -hmm. they're both plugging into the massive supply chain. They're both plugging in to conventionally produced yeah. or managed, whatever. So on the meat side, the nuances there, but. well, yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking about the meat side too and the management side, mm -hmm. and I'm just really interested in beef, well, because my company <laughs> yeah. is mainly about animal foods and how the different management practices, you can't just kind of hide behind a label, like you said. Just, exactly. It's just like, put your money where your mouth is, we're testing it. And yeah. I remember talking to Stefan Van Vliet and Fred Provenza about how much it matters, the diversity of what these cows are eating. Massively. Right, it's like, it's a, oh, it's grass fed and grass finished, but it's just sitting there eating a monoculture. Is it monoculture rye or is it polyculture forage? Right, I mean, is it, I mean, yeah. There's all kinds of labeling and marketing. This is the whole point about being able to test directly so you don't need to trust anybody's labeling and marketing. Not that there's not some people who are doing a good job and being as honest as they can be, but if you have a foundational reality where you can go and see anything and you don't need to trust anyone, then you can really know which brands to trust. Right? If you've got 10 people out there checking for mm -hmm. everybody else, that, I mean, we don't have that level of, of, of like all the brands have to do their marketing. Right? Mm -hmm. If the brand didn't have to do any marketing, they just did a good job and the people could check and see and the word went out quick. This is the best stuff to get. This is the second best stuff to get. Mm -hmm. and this stuff is all junk. Then the brands that are doing a good job would get, would get the market share. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's my thought. I, th I used the example of milk on this one. Like if you had... You know, uh, Stonyfield and Organic Valley and Horizon, you know, mm -hmm. these are your organic milks mm -hmm. that are generally available in most grocery stores across the U.S. Um, and you had 50 people with a meter around the, around the country that each went to the store and bought one of those, you know, all three of those jugs and brought them home and tested them. And they all said that 40 out of 50, well, I don't care, we'll say it was mm -hmm. Stonyfield was better. Mm -hmm. If 48 out of 50 said Stonyfield's better, than, than Organic Valley and Horizon, my guess is that would, you know, with social media being what it is, that word would get out and Stonyfield will start leaving the shelf more often. Yeah. And so, yeah, with the beef, there's a, there's a bunch of really good growers doing an amazing job that no one's ever heard of that are actually producing the best quality beef. And some of those big ones that are shipping around to people's houses <laughs> don't always have. Mm. In fact, they don't have the highest quality but they can market grass-fed and you don't really have a way of checking. 
And is it, the, is it the monoculture grass or is it the polyculture grass? So being able to provide some um, transparency mm -hmm. uh, and empiricism, I think is foundational. Um, and then if we align, if we take that and we understand that it's honest and we trust it, everybody, everybody does their diligence and they say, yes, this group is honest and this is what the answers are, and then we can start having a list of who the companies are with the best quality and people can begin to purchase accordingly. Um, I like that because maybe just it's for my own reason that my my ranchers do things really well yeah. and they have a very diverse species they they, work, they graze on. So you're probably going to be showing up pretty high on the level on the list. Yeah. Yeah, because you can hide behind. Well, there's so much to it. Also, you know, I like how you guys aren't saying all this stuff is trash. It's like, let's go for what's the best and not try to necessarily Don't call out the emphasize the, the negative. Yeah. No, emphasize the positive. Because yes, with some, I was thinking about in different climates where they could have more grass and they just have abundant grass and it's a monoculture grass and they have lots of rain and they can just throw their cows out there. I, I'm not, maybe it's not, it's not bad. It's not going to be in the twenties. It's probably going to be on a higher a range. A lot better than corn finished. Exactly. But then you have, my people are in kind of a semi-arid place. They're in Lubbock mm -hmm. and they, they don't have just abundant rain. Yeah. And so they, they have big swaths of land and they need to move their, their herd a lot, yeah. but they have like hundreds of, or I don't know if it's hundreds, into the dozens and dozens. At least dozens of different species of plants. Of different species and they're getting all these different yeah. varieties yeah. and uh, that just gives the meat so much more of these secondary compounds, right? All, everything, the omega-6, omega-3 ratios, the stress hormones, the, douche, the yeah, it's, yeah. Well, no, I know. <laughs> and places where you have lots of rain, you can still have polycultures, mm -hmm. right? It just, it, it doesn't have to be monoculture grass just because they have lots of rain. You could have a polyculture ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So those guys are now going to be saying, oh my God, we're being shown to be in the middle of the, middle of the, of the herd. Step up their game. And they're going to want to up their game and they're going to, mm -hmm. but they're going to be, yeah. So it's a competition to the top. Let's figure out a way to inspire people to be competing with each other to do, be doing a better job with honesty and transparency, because that's what we need. We need more, better food. Let's give everybody the tools that they can to manage the ecosystem more well and the, and the economic incentive to get paid better for doing it. If we do that, we reverse climate change. We reverse chronic illness. And we bring higher consciousness. The problem is, what are you worried about the big systems? Like everything that you're talking about is completely against the big food, big everything, big ag, big pharma. What do you think? Business so follows the market. Yeah. If you got, the, if you got, I mean, companies with large supply chains that can see which direction things are going are going to want to have first mover advantage against their comp competition. Um, I mean, the small producers are never going to be able to provide the scale of quantity that the big system is. Mm -hmm. If the big system says we're going to make more money doing it this way than that way, I think they're relatively agnostic as to the system. It's not like they're attached to doing things poorly. Mm. In fact, most of these big companies are made out of people that actually generally mean well and want the best for themselves and their kids and the environment. And so if we can tell them a story that they're going to make more money doing the right thing, especially if they move sooner than later, then pretty soon you get the big companies rushing to jump on board too, which is awesome, which is success. I say have Burger King and, and, and uh, McDonald's competing to have the better quality burger like that's that's success that's success mm, that's good market yeah that's well, not we're not against monsanto no, yeah, we're not against mm. big i'm not against big companies yeah. that's reality just do it better well if you, yeah if you guys are the third party that's not corrupted by all the money then you give them the tools so you can leverage their monetary incentives like to do better Right? Yeah, because yeah. I can see the campaigns. It's like McDonald's. We did the nutrient density test. We are at yeah. the top. We're above all the other fast food restaurants. Yeah, Wendy's and Burger King are here and we're up here. Yeah. Great. Guess who's going to be starting to try <laughs> to do less supply chain? I mean, yeah. I don't think it's a bad thing. I love it, but I guess so. Because, yeah, I talked to Dean Brown five years ago. Yeah. And he's saying, People, these big companies, he didn't name the names. He's like, these big companies are consulting with me. Yeah. Because they know. 100%. Behind the scenes. Yeah. And and there's good people in all these companies, right? It's not like everybody who works in Montana is a bad person. Mm -hmm. Right? They're generally good people who mean well, who have children, who care about their communities and, and the environment. And this is where they're getting their paycheck. 
And if they could, in some small way, affect the company they're working for to be doing things that would make them feel better about their work, they're Why probably going to want to do that just because everybody's got an honor and ethics and a conscience. I believe that, yeah. I don't think they're, yeah, like there's just pure evil people. I think that's like 0.01%. Maybe there's some, there's sociopaths. Something going here wrong. Yeah. Yeah, but otherwise but people want to do well. Foundationally, we've got an economic system that's driving, driving decision making. Mm -hmm. So if we align the economic incentives with beneficial other outcomes, I mean, just mm -hmm. use the system we've got. I mean, I'm not saying capitalism is the best system. I'm saying this is the system we've got. So let's work with it. Let's mm -hmm. let's figure out a way to use it to accomplish our objectives. This is amazing. I want to be one of the people in Austin with a device. So we're raising millions of dollars in donations right now, right? Until we have the money to build the next generation meter, we don't have the next generation meter. So, so where do people go? Uh, Biodistrient.org slash uh, donate. Yeah. And you guys on social media? Social media, yeah. We've got a bunch of stuff on YouTube. I mean, the last 10 years of our conferences. Um, yeah, the, the, the website is Biodistrient.org. Um, the science is at Biodistrientinstitute.org. Um, but yeah, I mean, at some point people need to show up and say, I got 50 bucks, I got 500 bucks, I got 5,000 bucks, um, together four million is not a big deal. Um, so. Well, let's support it. Yeah. This has been great. I can't wait for tonight. We can <laughs> spread the word a little more. Looking forward to a group in person. Yeah, I love the in-person stuff. That's why I yeah. built this whole thing, the yeah. Safe Center. It's been months and months of work but it's this is what it's for we just open on we barely we're not even open really i'm supposed to be there now we're not open because i'm not <laughs> even there but this is our first monday we're supposed to be open so i'm happy to be uh one of your first speakers amazing thank thanks you so much, much dan yeah thank you thank you